Author Fred Wilcox's previous book, Waiting for an Army to Die, looked at the effects of Agent Orange on U.S. soldiers who served in Vietnam. In his latest book, he turns his attention to the impact of Agent Orange on the Vietnamese. Next, during this event from New York City, Mr. Wilcox discusses his book with author and linguist Noam Chomsky. This is about 40 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the new Housing Works store that opened in April. Lisa Berdong, the manager, and her staff did a great job making room for us all. I'm Dick Hughes. I'm Dick Hughes. I'm the loose cannon, one of the people who uh, thought up this conspiracy to get us all together to think about Agent Orange and to do something about it. Those two great books, they were published by Seven Story Press. The first book originally came out in 1989. It was by Fred Wilcox, of course, and it was about the impact Agent Orange had on American veterans. The second book, which just is new, Scorched Earth, is about the Vietnamese and the impact on Vietnam. So we owe Seven Stories Press, who does so many books that nobody else would do, and Housing Works, and a few loose cannons, all our thanks. This is an important event to make a breakthrough on a horrible tragedy of many decades, Agent Orange, which still persists. If you have ideas about doing something when you see the books, please do it. After a colloquy, with our guests. We will have a Q&A. Please wait until you get a microphone in hand. We all want to hear your question. We all want to hear your answer. Thank you so much for coming, and it gives me great pleasure to, inter to introduce two very special people. Noam Chomsky, who most of you know and others will come to know, has been telling truth to power without rhetoric and just the facts, ma'am, just the facts, old Dragnet fan, for decades, and is still doing it. And Fred Wilcox, who has been out in the vineyards writing these two books, feeling the pain of knowing people directly affected by Agent Orange and seeing them pass away, or if they survive, to suffer terribly. So I'm going to leave it now to our two guests, and then your questions. Thank you for coming. I hope you can all hear. And when you step out of here, please try to do something about people suffering from Agent Orange. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, hello. Uh, thank you for all coming out uh, this afternoon, on this beautiful afternoon. My name is Fred uh, Wilcox. Uh, Dick Hughes has done magnificent, incredible work. He's helped the people uh, suffering from Agent Orange, and he's arranged this whole thing with his family. They've worked very, very hard. So I want to uh, express my appreciation for them. Uh, I want to express my appreciation for my family who's here, my children, my friends from Ithaca, and Professor Noam Chomsky, who's taken uh, out of his busy schedule to come here. It's wonderful. Thank you, uh, Noam, very much. <laughs> Uh, I, I would just like to talk a little bit briefly, and then I'll turn it over to Noam, about what I've been uh, trying to do for about the last 30 years, um, and that is tell people about what I consider to be, there are many, many tragedies, many historical tragedies, many tragedies in the world, but this is a great tragedy, and let me just begin by saying that three million Vietnamese people are suffering from the effects of chemical warfare, that is, the defoliation campaign that the United States government waged in Vietnam for at least 10 years. Uh, three million adults and 500,000 children. So one of the things I'd like to do today is really dedicate this whole uh, thing, the whole meeting uh, today to the children, to the Vietnamese children, to the children of uh, U.S. vets, Korean vets, New Zealand vets, Australian vets, all of these uh, people who have fathered or women who have given birth to seriously uh, deformed children, legless children, blind children, seriously retarded children, uh, all the same uh, result, as a result of having been exposed to something called TCD dioxin, which was the contaminant in Agent Orange. 
And so I really don't think you can overestimate this tragedy. I don't think you can exaggerate it. I have never tried to exaggerate uh, the tragedy because it's not necessary. Uh, it's ongoing. It's a tragedy that just doesn't seem to have any end. That is to say, if you go to Vietnam today, one of the things that really frightens the Vietnamese people is that they're seeing the third and fourth and sometimes fifth generation of Agent Orange children. So a lot of people will say, well, that war ended. You know, it ended in 1975. Why? I've been asked this. Why do you keep talking about it? Why do you keep writing about it? Uh, why do you keep obsessing over it, if that's what you want to say? And I say, because it hasn't ended. It hasn't ended for the children. It hasn't ended for the Vietnamese people. It hasn't ended for American vets who are reaching about the age of the late 50s and early 60s, our vets, and dying. Uh, and um, many, many people don't know about this, so I guess my goal has been and continues to be uh, to tell as many people as possible about this ongoing incredible tragedy uh, that is a direct result of chemical warfare. No, dear. Uh, well, just to, I mean, as all of you know, most of you know, <clears throat> this is the 50th anniversary, uh, almost to the day, in fact, of uh, some very significant decisions that were made in Washington, the Kennedy administration. Uh, John F. Kennedy and his advisors uh, basically decided in November 1961 to sharply escalate the war in South Vietnam, uh, which had been going on for some time, and to essentially turn it into a U.S. invasion of South Vietnam. At that meeting, Kennedy, those meetings, Kennedy uh, uh, authorized the uh, uh, U.S. Air Force to start bombing South Vietnam. Pretty soon they were apparently bombing, a, carrying out about a third of the missions under South Vietnamese markings, but didn't fool anybody except those who wanted to be fooled, uh, authorized napalm. Uh, and uh, what we're discussing here authorized what ought to be called chemical warfare, defoliation it was called. Uh, the bombing uh, then as you all know, expanded, led to uh, half a million American troops invading the South, uh, the bombing by, within a couple of years, by 1966, 67, the leading, uh, one of the leading specialists on Vietnam, the uh, military historian, Vietnamese scholar, Bernard Fall, uh, uh, in his last writings before he was killed in combat, uh, wrote that uh, he thought that Vietnam might not survive as a uh, cultural and historical entity under the impact of the most severe bombing, a severe attack ever launched to get an air against an area that size. Uh, it went on, uh, not only against South Vietnam and North Vietnam, at least where nobody was looking. The area around Hanoi was somewhat spared because there were a lot of eyes there, foreign embassies, uh, but the south of southern part of North Vietnam was turned into a moonscape. Uh, uh, South Vietnam itself you know, may never recover. The bombing ex extended to northern, northern Laos, which had nothing to do with the war in Vietnam. It was mainly because a lot of uh, uh, Air Force uh, planes were idle during bombing pauses, had nothing to do. Now here they virtually destroyed a, what amounted to a virtually Stone Age society, primitive society in, in northern Laos, littered with uh, unexploded ordnance, people still dying, uh, people that were living, literally living in caves for two several years trying to survive. I interviewed a lot of them back around 1970. Uh, then it expanded to Cambodia, uh, which was actually the most intense bombing in history. Uh, following Henry Kissinger's uh, immortal phrase, uh, anything, that, uh, an anything that flies against anything that moves. Those were the orders handed down by Kissinger from his boss to the uh, Air Force and the bombing in a brief period, just a couple of years, we now know uh, uh, reached the level of all uh, allied bombing in the Pacific region, the entire Pacific region, uh, during World War II, including the two atom bombs, all on a, a remote peasant, poor peasant society. Uh, a lot of consequences to that, and very ugly ones, but it 
the, the uh, finally more or less ended, but it didn't end. As Fred pointed out, the, the effects of the chemical warfare uh, continued and will continue. Uh, the, uh, it soon turned in very quickly, turned into crop destruction, uh, major war crimes. Uh, Fred can tell you a lot more about this than I can, so I won't go on with it. I just add one more word about it. Uh, there are serious consequences to uh, not paying attention to what we've done in the past. Uh, one of them is just moral. If we're incapable of facing up to our own history, we're, we're in trouble morally, uh, a serious problem. But it's also quite practical, because if you don't face up to it, you continue doing it. And in fact, that's happening. Uh, people are dying right now from American chemical warfare. Uh, one of the many things I've done over the years is a uh, number of visits to southern Colombia to uh, isolated, endangered peasant villages. Uh, sometimes when I go down, it's too dangerous even to go into the countryside, so they bring people into the local town to give testimonies about what's happening to them. Uh, these are people who have been subjected to some of the worst terror anywhere. Uh, Colombia now has uh, uh, displaced, probably this, I think the second largest displaced person's population in the world, I think after Afghanistan. Uh, millions of people uh, driven off uh, their lands. Uh, these are isolated, poor villages. Uh, uh, last time I went, about a year ago, you. You know, drive, driving with the uh, a truck given to us by the ombudsman's office of the region travels around almost impassable road. Uh, you, uh, go along the road. There's a tiny clearing on the side. Stop and go out. There's just a row of simple crosses. Uh, that's a place where uh, not long before. Uh, a bus had been stopped by paramilitaries who worked very closely with the military, and everybody in it was shot. Uh, that's life. But the worst part of life, in many ways, is the chemical warfare. Uh, we, call, we don't call it defoliation now. We call it defumigation. Fumigation, but uh, uh, same thing. It's uh, um, lethal uh, uh, substances sprayed from the skies, I suppose mostly contractors by now. And you see, and the effects are striking. I mean, first of all, it destroys, destroys the crops, not, not just opium, destroys everything. Uh, it poisons the land. Uh, there are people, being a coffee farmer is not easy these days, but there are people who've managed to kind of uh, develop a niche market for uh, organic, uh, high quality organic coffee that they can sell in Germany and so on. That's finished, because the land's poisoned, you can't grow anything more. Uh, people with uh, horrible uh, scars all over their arms, uh, uh, children dying, you know, the kind of things you see in Vietnam. And that's today, uh, just in the last couple of years, according to the Attorney General's office, about 140,000 people have been killed by the paramilitaries and the military, and there are other things too. But uh, this is. Uh, going on before our eyes, uh, we regard it as our right to carry out, pardon? Uh, sorry, <laughs> should have said that earlier. <laughs> we regard it as our right, it's not questioned, to carry out, still louder? I don't know if I can manage anything louder. <laughs> uh, we regard it as our right, we don't question it, to carry out chemical warfare in another country because uh, they're producing something that uh, our government doesn't like. Actually, the president of Bolivia asked a pertinent question. Uh, how, how would we feel if they were to uh, carry out uh, chemical warfare in, uh, in North Carolina and Kentucky to destroy a crop that's far more lethal than uh, cocaine. In fact, just take a look at the death tolls. Well, it's our right, it's not their right. Uh, this goes on before our eyes, and part of the reason is a failure to uh, 
pay attention to similar atrocities in the past. And this is not the end by any means. Just yesterday I, I got a letter from a, an ex-Marine who uh, fought in Iraq. And he was, I've known him for some years, he was uh, uh, part of the uh, 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 military force that uh, invaded um, the Fallujah uh, in November 2004. That was a horrible massacre. It's kind of like Srebrenica, actually, except worse in many respects. Uh, one of the respects in which it's worse is the kind of weaponry they used. Uh, there have been studies now uh, uh, by epidemiologists and other scientists in the Fallujah area, and it turns out that the level of radiation, persistent radiation in that area, is actually higher than Hiroshima. Uh, the letter he sent me yesterday, he, this young man, after he got out, has been devoting his life to uh, trying to compensate for that, those horrors. Uh, this was a scientific article that just appeared uh, studying uh, hair samples uh, of people there, and the hair samples have extremely high uh, evidence of uh, radiation poisoning. And it again has the usual effects, the same kind you described and you know, it could be permanent. And unless we face up to these things, it's going to continue. Uh, there's no barrier to it except internally to the United States. Nobody else can do anything about it. Uh, these are two examples, and you can add others. And American veterans suffer from it too. Uh, also, uh, the effects of uh, heavy metals, uh, probably uh, uh, depleted uranium, others, uh, that's has plenty of effects on American veterans who are exposed, but of course, as always, the major lethal effects are on the victims. And as Fred said, this can go on indefinitely, uh, even when the war is technically over, and even more so when we carry out similar operations elsewhere, as we're doing right now. Thank you, uh, Noam. Um, I'd just like to say a couple of things real fast and then open it up to questions. And that is, uh, I really like the way you brought it to now because people sometimes <clears throat> ask me, um, why do you talk about something that happened so long ago? The last spray mission in Vietnam was 1970. We left there, uh, at, theoretically, at least in 1975. Uh, the reason why I keep talking about this is because there's a cancer epidemic in this country, many other parts of the world, and the cancer epidemic is directly related to the toxic chemicals in our air, food, and water supply. I have four children. I'm sure a lot of you have children. I have grandchildren. I do not want my children or anybody's children uh, to develop cancer. I, I don't want to watch them uh, lose their hair and die slowly and painfully, beautiful children from cancer that could be prevented. It's not a matter of waiting for the next 50 years until we come up with a pill or a treatment for cancer. It's a matter of cleaning up our environment and stopping the companies that poison Vietnam and poison Cambodia and other parts of, and Colombia, other parts of the world, for profit. They, they do it for profit. They do it for money. They claim that they were doing it, well, in the name of uh, patriotism. They, were, they poisoned Vietnam. They were destroying the mangrove forest because they were really doing their patriotic duty. No, they were doing it to make money. They made Agent Orange. They sold it to the government. <coughs> they knew what was in it. They knew it was poison. And they didn't tell the government. So uh, one of the things that uh, I hope uh, I could accomplish through this book, Scorched Earth, is to say, look, uh, it's time to clean up the world, environment. It's time to clean up our environment. It isn't about something that happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. It's something about what's happening right now. And that is that we're all being exposed to these toxic chemicals and we're all at risk. Um, and so the tragedy in Vietnam is the tragedy here and in Europe and many other places. And it's a tragedy that I believe that we can all get together and do something to prevent. Uh, people are always asking, what should you do? Well, I would say one thing you could do would be to call Dow Chemical and Monsanto and say, we know. <laughs> we know what you did in Vietnam. We know what you're doing here, and we want you to stop it. Stop lying. Stop saying, for example, that there's no evidence that Agent Orange causes uh, cancer in human beings. The world scientific community knows that isn't true. The world scientific community has done all the studies necessary. They know that dioxin is tar carcinogenic. They know that. We all know that. Um, so, uh, with that, I just uh, I would like to just open the floor to, uh, to questions and uh, comments and whatever you want to say. I'd like to hear what uh, everyone has to say. Thank you, Fred. Um, we on? Here? It's on here. We on? Here. Okay. OK, 
Can you hear me? Um, so we are going to have uh, questions and answers and wait till we get the mic there. But I want to let you know we have several books up here, two by Fred, which are $10 a piece, bottom price, and he will sign them for you. We have one of Noam's books, 9-11, after 9-11, uh, and then there's also Philip Jones Griffith's book, uh, a photography book, which is on uh, basic sale for $20, a gorgeous photography book. So it's hard to beat those prices. Uh, here's the uh, mic uh, that Lisa will get over to you. Uh, ask your question, and let's see if we can get as many in as we can. Uh, uh, and Lisa, here's one. Yes, uh, thank you for your commentary. But I was just thinking as I listened, because I have recently found out about the matter of fracking, which is what I'm going to talk about. And I was thinking now in hearing your commentary that perhaps if the people in these countries and the victims that you mentioned were seeking revenge, they would say, we have found a way of doing ourselves in. Because as a friend of mine said, and if you're not familiar with fracking, I'll mention it in a minute, uh, fracking is not spelled F-R-A-C-K-I-N-G, it's spelled S-U-I-C-I. D-E, because with what we're doing, and it's already shown up in places like Pennsylvania, we can wipe out the water supply, and that's not something you can replace. Repeat. That's not something you can replace. Many people who live in the city don't understand that there's 13 inches of topsoil and the water supply that stand between us and what? Oblivion. For those of you who don't know what fracking is, they're about to have some hearings in the Delaware Water Gap. And that's happening uh, October the 21st. They're trying to get people on buses. If you want to find out about that, see me later. They, they, the, problem is, the problem is that people are unaware of where they stand. And if you have any comment on the subject of fracking, I think the idea that it's suicide is really on the button. Thank you. Uh, an honor to be here with both of you. Um, Noam, in particular, a hero of mine for 30 years. Thank you. So, uh, Fred, you implied if, unless I'm wrong, uh, toward the end of your talk that the government uh, was unaware of the consequences or seriousness of Agent Orange? Or did I misunderstand what you said? Uh, and, and if so, when yeah. did they find out, the government? Well, that's been a controversy ever since uh, people started talking about this. Uh, as far as I know, the chemical companies did not tell, particularly the military commanders in Vietnam, what they knew about the effects of dioxin on laboratory animals. And in 1965, uh, this is a memo that was in uh, Waiting for an Army to Die. Uh, Dow Chemical said, and I'm quoting, uh, dioxin is potentially deadly to human beings. Now, I do not believe that these uh, Monsanto and the rest of these wonderful corporations making lots of profit from San went to the United States government, the military, or anybody else and said, well, we're going to sell you this, but we want you to know that it's potentially deadly to human beings, that your troops, our troops, and the Vietnamese people and the rest are going to be uh, exposed to something. The, the chemical companies insist they did tell someone, but exactly who that someone uh, might have been, I don't know. And I don't think they did. I don't believe it. I haven't, I haven't uncovered any uh, uh, information to the, that uh, effect. Yeah. I think there's a, if I can add a word, there's, there's a concept that applies here and in many other cases. It's called intentional ignorance. So yes, you can choose to be ignorant of something which you do know about. And that applies all over the place. I mean, there's no way the government couldn't have known this. <coughs> Yeah. Well, it just doesn't make sense in, in terms of the profit system, <laughs> you know. I mean, these chemical companies, are they telling us, uh, the gas companies telling uh, people what's in the fracking in the water? No, they're not. You I know, mean, for example, in take the, the fracking. When uh, 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 an energy corporation su supplies you with oil, do they put in a notice saying we're helping destroy the world? <laughs> no, but right. you know it, and they know it, and if we don't pay attention, it's intentional ignorance. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Are we on? Can you hear? Sort of. <laughs> uh, so first of all, thank you so much from, from Ithaca. Um, Professor Tomsky, you've been a role model for me for so long. And I think um, you know, when I first learned about your work, you know, we had something called the language acquisition device. <laughs> and, um, and I'm wondering you know, what, what, the, what the plan for the communication acquisition device is, because I think you know, we have language and we use it, you know, like you said, for intentional um, omission. Uh, you know, the, the note that says we're killing ourselves quickly or slowly is not included in, in any of our packaging right now. So how do we, you know, globally or locally um, communicate that to each other? And, and how do we unite from today on? You know, how do we help? How do we do this? Well, it's, it's particularly significant in the United States. Uh, you may have seen uh, an article in the New York Times, I think maybe yesterday, uh, which reported what's been an open secret for a long time, that the United States is simply off the planet on this issue. Uh, just about every country, in some fashion or another, is trying to do something about the very serious problem of environmental, of global warming and environmental catastrophe. And they're doing it in different ways. Uh, we should be perhaps ashamed of the fact that the country that's in the lead on this is the poorest country in South America, uh, Bolivia. Um, they've gone to the extent of, uh, of passing legislation uh, that uh, nature has rights and we have to observe the rights of nature. Well, you know, sophisticated Westerners can laugh about this, but uh, the laugh, last laugh's going to be on us. Uh, the poorest country in South America is taking the international lead. Other countries are doing various things. We're not only not taking the lead as we should, but we're dragging it down. The United States is alone in tearing apart and restricting the very limited uh, devices that have been available to do something about the problem. It's pretty striking to look at, at Congress now and see that Congress is trying to dismantle uh, a, a legislation and institutions which were uh, instituted by the person who was in fact our last liberal president, Richard Nixon. Uh, that's not a joke, incidentally. Yeah. I'm not saying I like him, but if you take a look at the legislation, <laughs> yeah. So they're tearing apart the EPA, they're trying to restrict uh, uh, other limited environmental restrictions. And while the whole world is haltingly moving forwards, we're racing backwards. Mm -hmm. And what the United States does is, of course, of enormous significance. I mean, this is far and away the richest and most powerful country in history. If uh, we don't take the lead, uh, nothing much is going to happen. And if we're pulling the train backwards, it's uh, going to be bad news. So uh, here's where the problem is. And there are a lot of reasons for it. Uh, this is the only country that I know of, at least, where uh, uh, major centers of power are carrying out uh, uh, quite openly, I mean, they tell us, you know, carrying out uh, large-scale propaganda programs uh, to convince the population that uh, it's all a liberal hoax. Uh, the, American, the Chamber of Commerce, the biggest business organization, uh, American Petroleum Institute and others have uh, uh, made it quite public that they're carrying out these programs. Uh, well, you know, they've got a lot of people confused. Uh, if you take a look at the way the media handle it, it's, it's kind of a he says, she says thing. Like on one side, you've got, you know, 99% of serious scientists. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, Jim Inhofe or somebody else, and we've got to sort of uh, work it out for ourselves. Well, you know, individuals can't work it out for themselves. Uh, and there's a kind of a background of uh, a distrust for reason and science, which is itself very lethal. I mean, you shouldn't worship science. They can make mistakes and do all kind of awful things, but. Uh, still, it makes sense to study things seriously and carefully. And uh, it's a serious uh, cultural and institutional problem here, which has to be dealt with uh, in a sort of a fundamental way. So how do we 
communicate it. I mean, study a language can't tell you anything about that, but uh, people have to be out there trying to get others to understand what's really happening to our society. And do you want your grandchildren to have a decent world to live in? Or is it better for the petroleum companies to make more profit today uh, and they'll have an environment in which you can't survive? Um, those are real choices. Fracking is a case in point. Um, the fracking is actually a dual problem. One problem is what this speaker over here mentioned. Uh, there's a short, there's a direct problem, say, of destroying water resources and land and so on. But there's the longer term problem of uh, increasing the use of fossil fuels, no matter how you get them, uh, which is uh, uh, it's going to have a lethal effect on um, um, human society, in fact, uh, all living things. Yes, um, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Chomsky for coming. And um, um, I just really wanted to talk about uh, South American countries, how um, the economy is being affected and how um, the uh, dictatorships were um, planned out in the United States and sent over there um, so that they can distribute democracy in a way. So in a way, it's all part of the uh, conspiracy so that they can control uh, South American countries. But I want to talk about um, what do you think about um, the International, Mon International Monetary Fund? Is it a fraud to control the economy of the Southern um, American countries? Is it a, I didn't get the last part. Is it a fraud? Well, is certainly, it, I'm, I'm, certainly not a fraud. It a, it's very effective. Yeah, right, right. Is it a scam? What? Is it a scam? The International Monetary Fund. It's scale. It's scam. Scam? No, it's not a scam. I mean, they, you know, they do their work. They, in fact, uh, they're basically an offshoot of the U.S. Treasury. I mean, it's not literally true, but the U.S. Treasury has an enormous amount of control in what they do, and uh, there are uh, the same programs that are kind of turning the United States into a sort of a third-world society. Uh, are applied much more forcefully in weaker countries and having terrible effects. Uh, so the International Monetary Fund has, over the past several decades, been pressing very hard the uh, so-called neoliberal programs, uh, which have been a, a social and economic disaster almost everywhere. Now, not for everyone. So take, say, Egypt, which is right on the front pages. A part of the source of the uprising in Egypt has been on for a long time, but uh, peaking is because of the disastrous effects of IMF uh, structural adjustment programs, which have increased growth, but kind of the way they do here, uh, with wealth going into very few pockets and most of the population suffering. And that's been true in place after place. I mean, Latin America went through, as long as accepting these programs, they went through several decades of uh, a sharp decline, economic decline. It's now cast out the programs and is, there's a lot of uh, quite successful growth. Uh, we see the same thing here. We've been through it. I mean, it's not as rigid here as it is in poor countries, but uh, of course, the wealthy protect themselves, but um, it's part of the re it's part of the reason why, over the past essentially 30 years, uh, the U.S. has become has been in a kind of a vicious cycle of uh, sharp concentration of wealth, uh, really in one tenth of one percent of the population. That's you know hedge fund managers and CEOs and so on who. They don't do anything constructive for the society. In fact, they probably harm it, but or the economy. But uh, they gain enormous wealth, and with that comes uh, political power, and that makes it possible to accelerate the cycle. So we have the situation in which we are, with uh, in the richest country in the world, with uh, you know 30 years of pretty much stagnation or decline in incomes for the majority of the population, uh, while a small tiny group is getting fabulously wealthy and the country is seriously declining. Uh, so that, now I should say in, uh, about the IMF that more than the other global institutions, they've begun, begun to 
recognize this. And in fact, it's kind of striking that the IMF uh, chief economists have, uh, have been criticizing Europe for carrying out the kind of policies that they've advocated. Uh, Europe's in a you know, recession and is carrying out austerity policies, which are the worst possible thing to do in a recession. And the IMF has actually counseled them not to do that and to turn towards trying to stimulate the economy, which we should be doing too. So it's not a pretty story, but uh, you know they're not just devils, and they're coming out of a, 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 a background tradition, which is rooted right here mostly in uh, economic planning and economic policies, uh, uh, which have um, had pretty ugly consequences over decades. Uh, the countries that have been casting them aside and pulling themselves out of it are sometimes beginning to prosper. That's one of the reasons why Latin America has had a, a substantial improvements over the past decade. It also moves towards independence. That's significant. But it's not a scam by any means. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to say before uh, any more questions, if you haven't been down to Wall Street, the Occupy Wall Street, please go down and say hello to these people. <laughs> I mean, to, to me, it's really inspiring. I was down there the other day, and what wonderful people, and I think we should all just support them in every way we can. Yeah. What way? Oh, hello. Oh. What form should it yeah. take? What are some of your thoughts about Well, I think you better, better wait for, um, for, wait for, for Mike. Yeah. So I have a question. We have, to, we have to get the mics. Yeah. Okay. Over here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the ways that we continue to fight our wars um, have pretty devastating effects for the countries that we are fighting with uh, or occupying, uh, as well as on you know, members of the military that are, are coming home. So I'm wondering if you can speak a bit about what lessons we should take away from you know, what you know about the struggle for justice uh, with Agent Orange, both for the members of the military and people uh, in Vietnam. And what lessons can we take away from that for those of us that want to make sure that there is justice for those that are returning and are sick in so many different ways or for the people that are suffering in all the nations that we are fighting with? Well, I think that's an important question because one of the things, problems with talking about Agent Orange and Vietnam veterans is people uh, somehow assume that that's new. It's the first time that we've ever mistreated veterans, we've ever ignored them, we've ever failed to, uh, t to take them seriously when they're complaining about their ailments, and it isn't. Uh, that's part of American history. We send people off to war, pounding the drums, waving the flags, and then when we come home, they come home, we say, oh, I don't recognize you, I really don't know you. So to just say, as some people have, well, it's too bad about the Vietnam veterans, they got uh, hurt, uh, we didn't help them, we didn't pay any, but we're doing a better job uh, my own argument is, and I come from a working class, poor family, people join the military, yeah, they join the military because it's a job and because it's a way of getting out of poverty. But on the other hand, I wouldn't encourage anybody to join the military until the military decides to treat people uh, with respect and decency after they come home from the killing zones. Hello. I'm very sorry, but uh, Professor Chomsky has an appointment that he's almost uh, already a little bit late for at Columbia, and we have to get him up there. Uh, I was going to mention that the books that are here for sale, we donated them to Housing Works. So any books that you purchase, even at this low price, all the proceeds will go to Housing Works. So we're <laughs> serving two purposes. And if you can afford to do it, we would much appreciate it. Our apologies for those who didn't get their questions in, but thank you so much for coming out. And our thanks again to Noam Chomsky and Fred Wilcox. <laughs>